This YouTube series will cover material that we cover in our Introduction to Astronomy class from a meteorite found in Antarctica from the planet Mars and the search for life, all the way through to supernovas and black holes. We've spent a lot of time talking about the planets and their moons. Let's talk a little bit about the star that we orbit, specifically Sol, the same root as solar. Sol is a whopping 333,000 times the mass of the Earth. Remember, the biggest Jovian planet was 318 times the mass of the Earth. So the Sun is more than a thousand times more massive than Jupiter. In fact, the threshold to be a star is about 75 times larger than Jupiter. So if you're within 75 times the size of Jupiter, you're a planet. But the Sun is a thousand times the size of Jupiter. It represents 99.85% of the mass of the solar system. It's 109 times the diameter of the Earth. That doesn't sound very big, but remember we're talking three dimensions, so you could fit 109 times 109 times 109. You could fit more than one million Earths inside the Sun. And here's something we didn't see with the, the planets, luminosity. The sun has a luminosity, a brightness, an energy that it emits of 3.8 times 10 to the 26th watts. That's a lot of numbers. These are the same watts that we use in a light bulb. There is more power that comes off the sun in a second than the earth could use in a thousand years. We had an unlimited supply of energy coming from the sun. Almost inexhaustible. The sun has four and a half billion years worth of energy left to create. And we'll talk briefly in a little bit about how that energy is created. The sun rotates on its axis. But the rotation is differential. What I mean by that is if you're at the sun's equator, it takes 25 days to rotate once around. If you're at the poles, it takes 35 days. It rotates slower at the equator, excuse me, slower at the poles than it does at the equator. It is what's called a differential rotator. In fact, the sun has a north and a south magnetic pole, just like the earth has. So the sun has a magnetic field. But because of this differential rotation, these magnetic field lines get twisted up, sort of like strings lying across the surface. The sun rotates faster at the equator than it does at the pole. So as you twist up these magnetic field lines, you create these magnetic knots. Those magnetic knots manifest themselves as sunspots, dark regions on the surface of the sun. And around the sunspots, see, this is the surface of the sun. Heat wants to rise out of the sun. It wants to convect out of the sun. But there's a magnetic lid put on the sun. The sun looks like a pot of boiling water when you get up close to it. And that pot is, it's got a lid on it caused by the magnetic field lines. And that creates splatter around the edges. So when you have a large sunspot, you create things called solar flares, which are short-lived but unpredictable. They may last hours to days. And larger eruptions called solar prominences, which might last days to weeks, but are more predictable, associated with larger groups of sunspots. In fact, there is a sunspot cycle on the sun. Every 11 years we get a solar maximum and then things lull and then they peak again. So we had a solar maximum in 2001, and we'll have another, we had another one in 2012, we'll have our next one in 2023. We had a solar minimum in 2008, we'll have another minimum in 2019. Because of the magnetic field of the sun cycling through, we see a maximum and minimum number of sunspots on the sun. It doesn't mean that this will be 
hundreds. It just means that in 2012, we had more sunspots than we had had in 2011 or 2013. There is an 11-year sunspot cycle. And all this manifests itself on the surface of the sun. These sunspots sit on what I'll label the surface. We'll label that where the light comes off. That is called the photosphere, the visible surface of the sun, where light leaves the sun, the photosphere. Is that the edge of the sun's atmosphere? Not really. Just like the Earth's atmosphere doesn't just end, the sun has another layer a little further out, which is almost invisible except during an eclipse. That layer is called the chromosphere. And then lastly, the wispy outer edge of the sun is called the solar corona. So the atmosphere of the sun goes from the photosphere where we see sunspots. We see little bubbles of material coming up like pots of boiling water. We call those granules. So the photosphere has granules on the sun. These granules tell us that the sun is convective like a pot of boiling water. The sunspots sit on the top of the photosphere. Then comes the chromosphere and lastly this outermost wispy layer called the corona. The temperature of the corona is actually significantly higher than the photosphere. The photosphere is somewhere around 5,800 Kelvin. That's what gives the sun its yellowish hue. But when you get out to the corona, the little bit of material that's out there absorbs a tiny bit of sunlight and gets really excited. So what happens is those particles get to be millions of Kelvins worth of energy and they split apart. The protons go one way, the electrons go the other, shearing themselves apart, creating a stream of charged particles that race off the sun at millions of miles an hour. You know that as the solar wind. What we'll talk about briefly in our next segment is, where does all this energy come from? Let's take a peek under the hood.